This is the time of the year, Sandra, when I've been known to get up to snow good. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm Scott Montague from Coquitlam Search and Rescue and I'll be applying the glide wax to our computers today. Got some good news for you. If you stick around to the end, we, you might get one of our two special prizes from our sponsors, MEC and Hillsound. And everyone who sticks around to the end will get a freebie from our sponsor, FatMap. Your cameras and mics are off for this session, but we still want to hear your comments and questions. On your screen is a question mark button or a question box. Use it to post anything you want to tell us or ask a question and we'll answer online or in the Q&A part of our presentation. So actually, let's give that a shot now. Uh, find the question area, wherever it is on your computer or on, my, on your phone. Let me know where you're joining us from. Doesn't matter if it's Malaysia, Montreal, Kamloops, Kananaskis, just go ahead and throw it in the box now. While you're doing that, I'm actually gonna ask you another question. This should also pop up on your computer. The question is, which ways do you enjoy the winter in the back country? Do you do essentially foot-based stuff? Hiking, micro spiking, snowshoeing? I know I do that. Uh, do you do ice climbing, rock climbing? It's not, a, not one I'm into, but I see a lot of people doing it. It's really, really fun. Uh, Backcountry skiing, snowboarding. I you take my cross-country skis and go out even if there's no uh, groomed trail there. Snowmobiling, something I haven't done in years, mostly because I fell through the ice last time. Uh, and also you can check whether or not you do these things with your dogs, either on or off leash or ski joring, as I did just a couple of weeks ago. Maybe you have a dog sled, etc. So go ahead, select what you do. You can select multiple if you want to and let us know which ways you're enjoying winter in the back country. Look at that, we already have most people voted. Awesome. Sandra, what do you think? Okay, that's that where I thought it was gonna land. No, yeah. no, it doesn't no? actually. No, oh, maybe that's about the divide. What did you think? I was thinking uh, that there would be, maybe, maybe it's just a, a, a personal bias, but I thought there'd be more people who had their dogs with them. Call and I thought it would be more backcountry skiing, snowboarding, but the 80% falls to that hiking, snowshoeing, micro spiking, which is which has seen a huge increase. We, you and I could both attest yeah. to that over the last 10 years or so. Especially in, in, in the Southwest, absolutely. Like uh, uh, people are getting out and, and sometimes it's a case of they start down uh, and it's perfectly summerish. And by the time they get up to the top, they're hiking in the snow. Absolutely. So cool. We're tonight, we are fortunate enough to have the executive director of BC Adventure Smart leading us through how to have safe winter adventures, like all of those. You've seen her on TV, you've heard her voice just now and on the radio, uh, and you've read interviews with her in the newspapers. During the last 18 years, she has been with Adventure Smart. But believe it or not, her expertise even goes further back than that. Since 1992, Sandra Riches has been professionally involved in outdoor recreation, including time spent both as a park ranger and in incident prevention. Nowadays, Sandra closely collaborates with 
BC's 78 search and rescue groups, which has more than 2,600 people involved, uh, industry partners, tourism agencies, uh, destination marketing uh, organizations, parks, um, BC Hydro, all sorts of land managers, all of these people working with her with the goal of reducing the number and severity of incidents in British Columbia and across Canada that involve search and rescue. Please welcome the executive director of BC Adventure Smart, the leading lady of SAR prevention in the province, Sandra Richards. <laughs> Sorry, the last line makes me laugh. <laughs> the leading lady. Thank you very much, Scott. And Scott is our tech support slash guru, um, bio reader, uh, and Coquitlam Search and Rescue volunteer who's, who's offered up his time and energy to support our BC Adventure Smart webinars here that we do with BC Search and Rescue Association. Tonight I have uh, our Backcountry Snow Safety program available to you. It's going to offer you a really great introduction or reminder to outdoor safety, your personal preparedness with you, your family, your group and your friends, um, possibly people you don't even know. And we're gonna talk about those group dynamics, um, emergencies, gear, we'll get into our three T's and, and a little bit of search and rescue data that we base all of our outdoor education on. Scott did mention, um, we've got some great offerings for a couple of lucky winners and uh, everyone there at the end um, does receive a one month free trial from FatMap. So we'll talk a little bit more about those those awesome prizes from Mech and Hill Sound as we get closer to the end and a couple more polls in there as well. So lots happening and uh, let's jump right into uh, the presentation here so we can, we can get going. Um, we've, we've got a number of programs underneath our um, Adventure Smart umbrella, which is a national program that started in BC. Uh, uh, we're into our 19th year, actually. We started way back when here in British Columbia. And the whole goal, no matter where you are in the country, uh, is, is to follow these three T's. We, we've, we, we've considered these as our trifecta of outdoor safety, your foundation in building that uh, safety in your pack, literally uh, planning processes, what to do in an emergency. It's built in your mind and your pack and, and processes and what we can discuss with our fellow enthusiasts. And the more common this becomes, then it becomes habitual which is really where, where we're trying to reach with you. So this might be a reminder, hopefully, if you've followed us on social or joined us for any other session, or if it's an introduction, it's easy to, to digest and we'll go into each one of these. And the whole goal behind it all, as Scott mentioned in my bio, is we're here to help produce, you're also here to help reduce the number and severity of search and rescue calls in BC. And I have a few stats inserted into the slides as we go through. So I'll share some of those provincial um, search and rescue incident summary details with you and, and how you can learn a little bit more about that. This is Dinah, who's adorable, by the way, and uh, we got approval from Dinah's owner with Whistler Search and Rescue to use this picture. We've used her in some social posts. She gains lots of attention, that's for sure, and, and she's got a great sign there helping you understand what one of the signs it is all about. You know, and recreating into the backcountry is a big decision. That's what tonight's focus is about. We know there's recreating within the ski area boundaries, but tonight's about that backcountry piece and how you choose to go there, what you need to do prior, at the time, during, and in an emergency. Understanding the current avalanche forecast is critical. Knowing how to travel through that terrain, making those decisions based on terrain features that we'll talk about as well coming up, and how to understand and undertake that companion rescue. What happens when there's an emergency of that magnitude? Uh, what do we do and how do we do that, which comes from a little bit of tonight and a little bit of from Avalanche Canada and your continued uh, training that can be can be had certification based and mentorship. Before that backcountry travel, you need to have a comprehensive trip plan, which we'll share some information tonight about as well. And all the necessary training that, you know, we're choosing to go outside an area that is managed to go into an unmanaged space. And that management comes from us as individuals. It comes from us as group dynamic decision-making, that risk assessment and then management of, uh, to avoid any incident from happening, but also when it does, what do we do? How do we do it? Where do we do it? And how do we succeed at that? Taking all that gear is essential as well. And, and that equipment is, is critical 
um, as a basic essential pack, but those other pieces for this, this backcountry terrain that you need to have. And we'll talk about those three additional pieces to the essential list that we provide. So thanks again, Diana from Whistle Church and Rescue for being such a wonderful uh, model there. Inbounds, out of bounds, we, some of us have heard slot country, front country, back country. Uh, inbounds is that controlled area that we talked about within the controlled recreation area or CRA or a ski hill. It's managed with signs like this one through ski patrol. And, and we're never going beyond these boundaries if it's roped, fenced, signed, however it's identified and marked, uh, we're not going beyond that. And we're not following tracks that would lead to areas outside of that where it's been marked. And this is all managed by ski patrol. So two thumbs up and a big thanks to all the ski patrol out there who get up well before most of us hit the snow, put their boots on bright and early and, and get all this managed and assessed so that we can come up and have fun during the day. That unmanaged space, uh, and this is where I like to talk about out of bounds versus in bounds. So if I was at this sign and I was, I was, I wouldn't, but if, if I was considering going beyond that, I'm going out of bounds. Now, if I'm choosing to go into the back country that is at a different access point, it's at a, at a, at a trailhead or a gateway, that is leading me to a defined area into the backcountry where I know that's where I access it. This isn't an access point. This is not an access point. Going beyond the boundary here is going out of bounds. Um, so these are unmanaged spaces, again, full of hazards and cliffs and, and unmanaged uh, situations that you can get yourself into deep trouble in, where if you access the backcountry through an, an area that's gated or uh, an entranceway that's identified, there's signs often, there's avalanche ratings posted, uh, and or you know that this is the right way to enter that area based on the entrance trail, route, and, and uh, access areas. Let's talk about tree whales for a second before we jump into the crutch of our presentation tonight. Um, these are void areas, if you're, if you're not familiar, of loose snow at the base of a tree. Uh, at the base of all the trees you, you can see up on the mountain really and avoiding them at all costs is number one obviously uh, and if Scott if you happen to have that video that we shared a couple of presentations ago you're welcome to put that in the chat for those people to watch later but um, it's that void space and it's loose snow it's not packed it's very light and as a skier or a boarder or a snowshoer or a micro spiker or dog gets close to the base of this tree that that area is easy to fall into because it's very, very loose. Um, we're trying to stay away from them as best as possible. So a lot of us uh, play and have fun boarding or skiing in the trees. I always stick with buddies in our groups and I kind of, you know, let's say there's 10 of us, we pair off to one other person at the very least and that's who we always look for make sounds for if we can't see or hear them and, and we're trying to keep a, an eye out for each other that buddy system is key um, and, and getting out of them different situation taking that time to to have that buddy system set up before you go into this area so that if i fell in scott was my buddy scott would locate me and see me because he always was keeping it keeping an eye on me we're looking out for each other he could come and find me quickly uh, and I'm going to do my best to, to not panic the best I can. I've fallen in one and it's a tricky spot not to panic. Uh, and most of us go in head first. Momentum would take us that way. Uh, and we're doing our best to slowly upright ourselves and or use any branches you might feel in there to steady or pull yourself up slowly. And your partner, your buddy can, can come and help rescue you. And there's different techniques on getting someone out of a tree well so that they don't go down any further and and uh, we'll make sure you get that video to have a watch. There's a great technique on how to shovel out a subject who falls into uh, a tree well. So let's avoid those as best we can and keep that buddy system in check. Cornices is, an, is another feature that we need to look out for. And, and if, if you're familiar with eating lemon meringue pie, I haven't had that in a while, but that's not what I always think about when I talk about cornices. The meringue that gets formed and built on that, built on that pie is, is kind of what a cornice would look like. You can see here in the graphic, We've got a snowshoer that's coming close to that potential failure zone, which is really hard to define because there are not dotted lines out there in the backcountry as saying, don't go beyond here. That's up to us to assess, understand what's be below us if we're walking on a ridge line like this, uh, or what's above us if we're walking below this cornice down in a bit of a, a draw and we're making our way through an area 
We're looking up, we're looking down, we're looking out, we're observing the area. What we're also doing is watching the storm cycles. Before uh, you head out for that snowshoe, let's use that as an example. And, and what is that doing for the train you're about to go for a snowshoe on? Has, has the wind been strong? What direction is the wind blowing? Has there been um, a storm cycle that came through and deposited a lot of snow? Is, 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 has it been a winter like what we're in right now? There hasn't been very much that's come down. So what's happening out there? We can pay attention to this throughout the season. And I always like to build that snowpack in my head as well and think about the cycles that come through. For snowpack and cornices, those features will change. Breaking off can happen well back from that edge. As you can see where we've put that line, it's way back from where you think you could get. You think you could get much closer. Uh, and so that's, keep that in mind. And they break off suddenly and quickly. You've probably seen some videos out there. And they also then can cause avalanches below. Um, staying away from that edge is key. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, looking up, down, knowing the route that you're traveling around and through, uh, what are the features commonly seen throughout the winters of past? Uh, does it build up in this one area more than others? And you can look at history and knowledge and, and include that into your trip planning and to see where are the best areas to go and checking those weather conditions um, from all different sources, all different sources. Let's jump into that first T and trip planning is critical. And Scott could attest as a, a GSAR member who responds to search and rescue, that this is a great piece that can really help out those 2,600 search and rescue volunteers find you faster, which often means you're in better condition, which reduces the severity of a call. This is essential to do before the dog walks because we've had, and Scott can say this too, was with his SAR group, uh, dog walkers have had search and rescue calls and some pretty severe ones. Um, it's not always just a big backcountry adventure um, and it's not always in, in uh, severe extreme terrain either. So knowing the avalanche forecast as we choose to recreate in the backcountry is critical to this piece. Uh, that's where we're choosing to go. Planning your route and nav navigation. Again, this is, this is you around a table or dinner over nachos and beer or online with your friends and texting each other, all these different resources. So I found this, I found that, here's a book, here's a link. Here's the Backcountry Snow Safety webinar to share it with another group of friends who were going. It's all part of that pre-adventure. So you're planning, planning all that prior. This is what's happening beforehand. Knowing the terrain and the conditions is a plus. There's often areas that I will go that I'm familiar with. I know the features, uh, how the cycles would move through that area, um, spring, summer, winter, and fall. And, and so a lot of us go to areas we're familiar with, but this happens to be um, an important piece if you, if you do know that. The weather, we'll talk about how you can compare temperatures against elevation gain and how that applies to situations that might be an emergency. And leaving all of this detail, your group definitions of who's going, uh, what are they carrying, what are their abilities, what are their skills, uh, the car being used or the bus being traveled on, is it a loop? Is it a one way in, one way out? Is it, is it connecting different trails? Uh, leaving all of this, what's in your pack, the medications you're carrying? Do you have a fire starter? Do you have all the equipment? So just keep thinking of that list. And that goes on a, on a detailed emergency um, plan that gets left with a trusted contact. Then they can contact search and rescue if need be. We'll talk about how that happens shortly. First T, trip planning, lots of detail group group and do it together and then you discuss who your emergency contact is individually and leave that information with them. The avalanche forecasts and hazards uh, if we're choosing to go into the backcountry we need to be aware of them. Uh, avalanche Canada I refer to them so much during the winter there are industry cousins at the same age as we are the programs are not us individually uh, and, and so as we're both into our 19th year of doing what we do uh, they are experts in avalanche ratings, hazards, dangers. And, and here's a, a little example of their danger ratings, just a, a few definitions. But once you've taken an AST or an avalanche skills training course, you can understand more detail on how this would apply to your adventure based on if you're recreating below treeline, at treeline or alpine. And what do these mean for you and your group? And how does that help you decide? It supports your decisions on how you would go to these different areas in the backcountry using the forecast and, and directly apply it to your equation. You're, you're really coming up with an equation that's going to work for you, a successful equation that will work for you based on all of the reliable information you can get. 
planning your travel route and navigation, there's 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 so many pieces to this and it ties into not getting lost. Let's go to the very bottom page. I've got a little um, exclamation mark there. We collect a lot of data, uh, volunteers like Scott, uh, everyone who does respond to a search and rescue, that group or one of the managers, enters it all into a provincial data management system. So we have information on all the incidents that happen throughout the province. I get to, and our team at BC SARA, BC Search and Rescue Association, go in there, mine it all out and figure out what's happening, where is it happening and who is it happening to. So we know that getting lost and disoriented is one of the, it is the second most common reason for search and rescue in BC. So by you planning your travel route and your navigation, you can help mitigate the second most common reason for search and rescue. Using those guidebooks and the resources we talked about in your trip planning phase, uh, knowing your group's uh, limitations and, and abilities and how does that apply to where you'd like to go or where you should go. Those are two, two big pieces. Making sure that all of this activity is, is coordinated and, and, and facilitated uh, within daylight, ideally. We're starting to get a little bit longer of the daylight. I noticed it on my afternoon walk today, uh, which is great, but still that window isn't huge. So our opportunity for recreation is, is somewhat limited at this time of year. And that's a key piece to plan that recreation within that window. Making sure you're all fit enough for your activity. That can also dictate um, how you work with the time that you have and the trail you're on. And, and, and all of this is applied to that route finding and navigation. So lots to go into this piece, but you can, if managed successfully and assessed previously, you can hit this nail on the head and, and not get lost and not get disoriented and help us mitigate uh, the second most uh, reason for search and rescue in BC. Let's talk about how we could pick terrain and understanding those conditions, paying close attention to the detail. This will apply to our weather in a slide or two ahead, so bear with me here. Let's do a, co a comparison of Dog Mountain, which is in North Vancouver, Mount Seymour Provincial Park. Uh, my old stopping grounds as a park ranger. It's where I used to work. It's a lovely trail. It's only about five and a half K long and about one hour and 15 to do. Middle picture, true to the North Shore, <laughs> limited visibility socked in, low cloud, but you can get a gist of the terrain and it's very uh, doable, snowshoes, micro spikes, and when the trail is hard packed, it's, uh, it's usually quite defined. And if we come over to what you might see here, we've got a little bit of a topographical map. So if you understand what those contour lines mean, you can read that. And if not, you can come down and still see the five and a half, uh, 5.6K, and it's about 165 meters gain in elevation. So not too much. I always call this a roller coaster hike and it gently gets you out to a beautiful view of uh, the city uh, backside of grouse. Let's compare it to Sigurd Peak. The length of time is a little bit longer, 14 kilometers, and we're at about almost eight hours here. So big difference. Middle picture defines what it looks like. We're getting into different terrain here, different aspects, exposures. Uh, I'd say we're just tree line here. Uh, and so here's where the avalanche forecast is going to apply. And this is where you'll collect that information at Avalanche Canada based on the region that you're recreating in. And you can really pin down, they're great, their filters are awesome. And it really helps you filter down to the region you're in and the area. And it gives you great, great um, current updates from the forecasters. Checking the weather, it's more than just looking out the window. Uh, it's more than just checking the, the Apple app on your phone, if that's your choice of mobile. And it's looking into the, the different levels of the weather and it's essential before we go out. We know it could change at the drop of a hat any time of the year. This year, it's been a unique winter, I'd have to say, no matter where you are. I know I'm impatiently waiting for more snow to get skiing in. Uh, and so is my boyfriend for snowmobiling, but picking different terrain and different areas to play is still doable, but anything backcountry wise is, the snowpack's been unique, no question. But let's look when we're checking the weather, we're looking at those temperatures and how they fluctuate and when is it going to really come down, snow, sleet, rain, whatever. So by 6 p.m. in this demonstration here, we've got 90%. So I want to, I ideally would want to be done by 5.30 at the latest if the weather could be so um, specific. The likelihood of precipitation, let's pay attention to that. The wind speed's going to be a factor if we think back to the cornices and how that will build that lemon meringue of snow the wind speed and the wind direction is, is part of that feature build. 
precipitation amount is big. We're all wanting some snow, but as it comes, how does that affect the snowpack and how does that affect our decisions? And sunset time, do we know what time that does set? And are we prepared to be out there beyond that in case there is an emergency? So we're always trying to plan that adventure to be uh, back home uh, easily by sunset, easily. But let's just look at this general rule for a second on a clear day. So think of everything as completely 100% aligned on a clear day, temperature decreases, give or take uh, a degree or two, by about 10 degrees for every thousand meters that you gain in elevation. Let's have another peak at Sigurd Peak. So we knew it was 14K, but we also knew it was eight hours. So you're out there for a bit, a little bit longer. The elevation gain is the big piece here. So we know that if you've gained 2000 meters, there is, again, with a grain of salt, roughly 20 degrees difference. So imagine it's, let's play a little a scenario game. Uh, this is what you can do, and I encourage you to do in your, in your trip planning phase with your friends. Come up with a scenario and, and go through the paces verbally and just say, okay, what if Scott breaks his leg at 2,000 meters at 5.30 p.m.? And talk about it amongst your group. It's, talk about first aid. Talk about communications. Talk about creating a shelter, keeping warm and dry. Uh, talk about what's in place if you don't have communication. Um, using your primary means of communication, which are spot, in reach, solio, because your secondary means of communication, your cell phone may not have battery use, maybe it ran out, maybe you got lost it in the snow, there's no cell reception. Have a conversation like that and really go through some paces about um, scenario-based emergencies. And we could come up with scenarios, okay, Sandra, you're in charge of communications, perfect. George, you're in charge of first aid, got it. Sally, you're in charge of signaling to the aircraft once it flies over. And uh, John, you're in charge of keeping Scott's mental state calm, collected, comfortable. So we all have to do's. Just a, a little example of what you can do in that phase of trip planning. The comprehensive trip plan, I know I probably broke all the rules on this slide with how much information do you put on it. <laughs> so let's just go to the, the, the one, two, three, four, five W's and the H, which we'll talk about a little bit more as well. That's what's going into your trip plan. We make it easy. We have an app that you can use, and I'll give you access shortly if you don't already have it on your phone. And this is all the information, and as much information in each one as possible. Why are you heading out there? Are we skiing? Are we mushroom picking? Are we boarding? Are we micro spiking? Are we dog walking? When and when do we expect to be back? Specific information on where, not just I'm going for a backcountry ski tour in the Sea to Sky Corridor. Way too big of an area to think, where the heck is Sandra? Really pin it down. Uh, color, what? Green, red, black, blue. Hopefully it's bright oranges and yellows and, and blue so that it's easily spotted. And who's going? All the details of all of us in that group, our abilities, um, our, our challenges. Maybe I just got over a broken ankle. I'm good to go, but I'm a little bit slower. So we're only going to go halfway, not all the way. Every bit helps start search and rescue. And then how? How are we getting to and from? Bus, transit, car, drop off. Two cars, one car. This is all helpful information for Scott and all the others out there. If something unexpectedly happens, this is where they want to start. Is that your trip plan? Uh, leaving this back and forth via text works. You know, you can you can just check in with your emergency contact and let them know where you're going and, and all this information is super helpful. That's one way to communicate an emergency plan. A sticky note on the fridge works. If you have a counter in your house or your kitchen or in the front hall where you can leave a detailed note, um, at the very least a trailhead selfie. But what we're really asking for is to use a, a detailed plan um, created by you so that it can be passed over to your emergency contact. You know, we've got color of jackets in here. Um, where we're leaving a car, a Garibaldi Lake campsite. There's details in here, right? Times, um, and, and all of this can be left in a text. There's no problem with this, uh, but we do ask for as much as possible. So the more the better. I think you're getting the point there. Names and numbers in case they can't reach me. Uh, and what the app does, it allows you to text or email this all to a friend and you just fill in the fields of what you should be doing and it hits all the W's and the H, and it allows you to enter that on there. So it's pretty pretty handy. I'll give you an access to it in a second. 
training uh, it starts from when we were just getting introduced to outdoor recreation or maybe before we even thought we would. I grew up in Ontario um, and our family didn't go camping or hiking or mountain biking or uh, I did a little bit of skiing with some friends but you know but what my family and my dad specifically did teach me was how to use an axe, how to start a fire as one example. Uh, it was my job to fill the wood box after school and uh, get that fire going every day in the family room. So little did I know that would be a great skill to have later in my life when I moved to BC. But we've broken training into different areas. Activity specific would be avalanche skills training, a uh, mountain bike course that I took uh, a couple years ago to do some riding improvement, <laughs> which, which is good. Physical fitness training is another one. Uh, like it or not, it, we're all better off to train throughout the year so that when it comes to ski touring time or sledding, snowmobiling or mountain biking or any seasonal sport, we're, we're ready for that. Uh, navigation and route finding. We talked a little bit about that earlier, but having the training to understand how to use a topographical map and a compass together and not just rely on these little devices that we think do everything, uh, but they have some limitations. MEC offers a great one-on-one uh, navigation. There's great providers out there that you can take courses. Wilderness first aid, the scenario I used was Scott breaking his leg. Uh, one of us, if not all of us, should have first aid to help Scott and uh, and make sure he's comfortable and administer first aid before first responders came to help further. And then rescue and emergency training. I consider tonight a part of that section of our training. You're introducing yourself or reminding yourself of some really great habits that we want you to have. And, and it's a great start if it is. And thanks for joining us if it's a reminder as well. Bottom left shows you the most common reason for search and rescue, and that's injury. That can come from anything from poor footwear, uh, poor physical fitness, uh, slippery rocks, um, poor snow conditions, icy backcountry trail. Uh, it could be caused from many, many things, but injury is the number one. So having that first aid can really help the most common reason for search and rescue if your group can administer first aid and know how to manage that situation. So that's training. It's continuous. It's ongoing. We've broken it down into these little bits and bobs, uh, and and it's great just to continue with that. And tonight is part of that. So, thanks for for getting another notch in your belt with this one. Avalanche Canada is that extended version of this winter training for the Avalanche Skills Training Course, right? It, it's it's key. It's it's highly recommended. So they've created the curriculum, and then there's providers who actually deliver the programs. Uh, they talk about formation and release of an avalanche. How to identify that terrain. Remember, we talked about picking routes to to um, avoid cornices. They'll talk about that uh, avalanche terrain areas. Basics of trip planning. They go into. It's great. The tools and resources that you can use uh, to mitigate your risk. The appropriate travel techniques of group uh, gear. There's lots of great pieces to that section. I, I like that piece of the AST and the companion rescue. If you haven't checked out Abby Savvy, I'm sure Scott will throw it into the chat or questions. Um, that is a great spot to go. Their website gets you up to snuff on lingo and introduces or reminds you again, or you can take the avalanche skills training, but they're Abby Savvy and new to the backcountry. They've got some great pages there that can really set you on the right track. If that's of interest to, to take it to another level, to take it to another level. And if you're spending time in the backcountry and you've learned some uh, lingo and, and terminology here with us and, and you're familiar with and maybe an AST course is the next step for you. Taking this, the essentials with you is key. So this is our third T of the, of the three T's and packing this with you is easy. Uh, I bet you have most of it at home already or you can borrow it or purchase it and create your essentials which I consider to be the foundation of your pack. Uh, like the foundation on your house, it supports your family and your system that you run in your home and it keeps you steady and firm and allows you to do what you do day to day. The essentials in your pack will allow you to do that in an emergency. Uh, so we've got our basics, which I'll go through the list, and then we have season and sport specific, which we'll talk about those three extra pieces that we have to have for backcountry winter. But let's jump into the basics first and see where that can go. And, uh, and hopefully this is a reminder for you or a great list of, of new pieces of gear that you weren't really thinking about al already. We've got a list of check marks here. And a lot of times when we're doing outdoor education at trailheads or at schools or at workplaces in communities, people think, oh, this is a lot to pack. This, is, this sounds too much to look for, put together and carry. 
but it's really simple. So we've got a red sock here, the headlamp and flashlight, your light source, extra batteries are critical to bring along. I love wearing a headlamp, hands are free for first aid, uh, food, communications. The fire starter is another one to have in there. All the lint from your dryer as you take it out because it's a fire hazard uh, can go in a small little Ziploc bag with some waterproof matches. There's a great fire starter. Uh, cheesies burn really well. Uh, potato chips, an old punctured mountain bike tire tube, cut up in little squares, that burns well. Cotton balls, dose and Vaseline. There's many versions of a fire starting kit, but as long as you know how to manage, start and maintain that fire and put out when necessary. First aid kit and pocket knife or a utility knife. Uh, and that matches your first aid training, sun protection and emergency shelter. That all fits nicely into that tiny little red sack there that we've shown you. So we're trying to show you it's easy, it's simple, and it's, it's, it's not difficult to pack in your pack. The rest of the items, extra food and water, that's, this is extra for those emergencies, right? So you've packed your water and your food for your activity, and then the extra food and water is, is in case of emergency. Uh, extra warm layers, waterproof clothing. I have an extra puffy that I love. It, it, pun it punches down really small, it packs up nicely, and that navigation and communication. So those are your those are your basics. That's your foundation. That's your foundation. Here's a few visuals just to expand upon that. So the top left stays the same. So there's our foundation in the top left. And then for backcountry skiing, here's some of the items that you can carry with you and should. Avalanche transceiver, shovel probe, uh, we've got some extra gloves here, gel packs, banana, some kind bars, goggles. So just an example of some season and sports specific gear. Taking these essentials, these extra pieces, avalanche transceiver, shovel probe, critical. So we've got your, your foundation, the, the, the essentials are all listed, and these three pieces have to go with you into the backcountry. And they're mirrored and matched up and married to your avalanche skills training course that you've taken. So there's a little prep, uh, there's some financial investment, there's time and dedication for you, but this, this is where you're choosing to play um, and manage your own risk. These are the critical pieces that you need to understand. Um, I, like, I love this picture. It actually gives a great example of um, using that shovel efficiently, directional shoveling of, of that snow. And, and actually the video, if we've got it in there, you can watch about the tree well. They talk about sh the shoveling. Uh, direction and how you would send that snow in the right direction. This is all part of that AST course too as well. So those these three pieces need to go. Transceiver, shovel, probe. Uh, let's keep moving on here. What to do in an emergency. So we've reviewed the three T's, trip planning, training, taking the essentials, season and sport specific gear. What if an emergency happens? So we know in British Columbia, Currently, we're just under 2,000 search and rescue calls a year. We're, we're, we're creeping up on getting back to pre-pandemic search and rescue call volume, which is, which is very exciting. It was extremely high during COVID. We'll talk about that in a second. I've got a bullet coming up. But if there is an emergency while you're out there, we need you to apply the stop analogy. Stop, think, observe, plan. If you can just remember the stop piece and stay there, that's a great start, if not one of the most important pieces. This analogy um, really highlights the importance of that survival attitude that has included all of your planning and everything that you, you led up to this point, rather than irrational behavior based on fear. And don't get me wrong, fear might still play a role. Anxiety, worry, maybe injury, cold, weather, dark. There's, there's a lot that's going to go through, but if we can think about at least applying the stop analogy. And maybe in your pre-trip planning over nachos and beer, you came up with a, a scenario that allowed you to kind of go through a little bit of the baby paces to see what you would do in this emergency. This is a big piece to remember. We've talked a lot about that a lot on our socials lately. Who to call? Uh, you know, Scott and I know a few people in search and rescue in the province of BC, but if Scott got lost and needed help, or if I got injured out there and I needed help, help from search and rescue, him and I still, and along with all of you and everyone else, needs to phone 911 uh, if you have reception on your phone. We'll talk about secondary and primary pieces a little bit more. So this is your secondary piece of communication. So let's say you do, let's be optimistic. Let's say you do have cell reception and you can use your cell phone. The number is 911 and you're gonna ask for police and they will then 
dispatch uh, that local search and rescue group to you based on the needs of the call. If it's avalanche, swift water, high angle, back country, front country, uh, seasonal, that will be defined then. But it has to go through 911 to get a tasking number uh, through the services. So 911, ask for police, explain your situation. And this is really important if you are, when you are, giving all of this information to your emergency contacts so that they know this is the process. Uh, so that they're not phoning a friend who they think is with search and rescue and Prince George, and I'm just going to give them a call. Um, this is a key piece. So remember, your cell phones are your secondary pieces of communication. Preserving the life on those mobile devices, let's talk about these for just a second, is key. Travel with it on airplane mode, ideally. Um, know your location and where to find that. You can find that on your phone. Uh, there's a compass on there. It will give your lat and long, your latitude and longitude. When there is an emergency, so let's say you've applied that stop analogy, please, please don't phone your friends and family. It seems to be an instinctual thing to do. We want to connect with them. We want that comfort. We want uh, to feel that ease in talking to someone that we know and share. Don't use up your battery power on any of your devices on that. There's been some incidents in the past, one particularly in Cypress Provincial Park where a subject did do that and it, and it didn't end well. It was a, a fatal incident, unfortunately. There was a lot involved in that equation, but one of her first phone calls was to a family member out of province and her phone was very low in battery versus using that to contact 911 and share the specifics of Latin long and staying put. So that's a key piece. Emergency alerting devices um, does not mean that you can enter the backcountry unprepared. So just because you have a Zolio, a spot or an inreach doesn't fit. Don't, don't be so reliant on these devices that you think that you don't still have to be prepared for everything else. Your communication starts at home with your merge contact, trip plan, that's your start of that. Critical. Uh, I mentioned them a few times, but here's a few visuals of those pieces, spot, inreach, Zolio or sat phone as your primaries, as your primaries. And your secondary is that cell phone. Key pieces there. I think we've hit that nail on the head. So let's talk about what to do in that emergency and the details of the stop analogy. Uh, we've got this broken down for you and it's pretty easy to remember. Uh, or you can take screenshots of this tonight and keep it in your phone in a special folder. And you know, what, what if this happens and you're fearful and anxiety ridden, injured, cold, dark? Oh, what does Sandra say? You could go right there if, if you could pull it up. Uh, so as you stop, it allows you to really bring yourself down to the ground and assess, right? Does anybody hurt? Why have we had to stop? What is the emergency? Do we need to call for extra help? Are we lost, injured, disoriented? Did we exceed our abilities? What, what's the emergency here? But by stopping, it allows you to assess. The thinking part comes in. I like this section because it talks about a lot of what we just already went through the whole beginning of our presentation. How will you contact search and rescue? Well, we know after today that you'll leave a really detailed trip plan with your emergency contact. So there's already a piece of communication you've set in place through the app, sticky note, text, whatever. You've, you've, you've created an, an opportunity through police and search and rescue to access your information. So you're already communicating that way. Uh, will anyone know you're missing or lost? or not, not getting back on time, they will, because you've left it all on your trip plan. Uh, will anyone know where you are? Again, these answers are yes, this is a great one, because you've left it all on where you are, the details of the trail, the park, the region, uh, your route on your plan. And when should you call search and rescue if there's an emergency? So let's go back to our scenario with Scott. Sorry, Scott, you've got a broken foot tonight. Uh, when should you call? When should I call if Scott was injured? I'm gonna call as soon as possible. There's so much that goes into play from when I make that phone call until it gets through police to search and rescue. The SAR volunteers are um, paged, texts, notified. Uh, they have to assess their safety after they've reached the, the destination to start that search. What are the conditions for them to enter that area? Is it safe for them? Is it avalanche prone? Is it is are there weather conditions there? There's that place. They have to make a lot of decisions where it's safe for them to go first before they will start to look for you. Long story short, I'm great at long answers. Uh, you need to phone right away as soon as possible. Are you prepared to treat a medical emergency? That goes back to the training piece for first aid. So the answer would be yes. 
And do you have the essentials to keep warm and dry? Again, yes, this slide's a nice positive energy and uh, it, 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 you're all equipped for all of these questions to, to answer them and do them properly. So there's ways to think through this and be comforted that you've got all this in place and you're able to do it. Your observations are key. We talked about tree wells and cornices already and, and different tr um, backcountry features that might be hazardous if it's cliffs, signages, uh, avalanche terrain, avalanches. Um, and as we observe where we've stopped, we're choosing a safe location. And are there any other immediate hazards around us? Are we close to fast creeks running below the snow right now? It's melting like crazy. Is that a concern? Uh, are we below a cornice? Are we near a tree well? Uh, let's make sure we're in that safe area. So we're looking to create shelter, make shelter, build shelter in a safe space at our stop location. And if there is a clearing in that, that vicinity that's a great spot to make yourself as big as possible to aircraft when and if they don't always but when and if they do fly over and you're allowed to make yourself more visible bigger brighter and seen we have a good slide for that coming up too and now you get to plan so you've stopped you've thought you've observed and now you're planning you're using the essentials from your pack as a group um because you've all carried this, not just one out of 10 has carried this, each of you have car has carried everything. You're using the essentials to build your shelter. Uh, it could be a shelter you've, you've carried in. Um, you're building a fire, which we've seen some examples already this winter of incidents where I think it was either snow bikers or snowmobilers that had built a fire while they were waiting to keep their, their friend warm and the group uh, comforted while they waited for search and rescue. So knowing and having that ability and able to do it is, is a great piece there and adding those warm layers to keep warm and dry. Um, the average search and rescue call time is about six hours. So imagine, Scott again, broken ankle still, sorry Scott, it's 5.30ish and we've called in. Now it's dark already, it's easily dark by 5.30, it's cold, he's injured, uh, we're having to manage and we've got about six hours of a window here that we need to keep warm, we need to keep fed, hydrated, happy, uh, comfortable, um, not worrisome as much as we can. So keep that six hours in mind. And that's all based on data driven insights that we get from all of the incident summaries. We're allowed to share that. The clothing is critical. It's never cotton and it's always a three layer system. We've got our base layer that's fitted and nice and fit, um, almost like a hug of a top and bottom layer. Uh, synthetic or poly polypropylene are ideal. Um, we're tucked in and, and we're warm. That layer system helps us. The, the middle layer is thermal. It can be a fleece, um, uh, a puffy, which so many of us have now. And then that outer layer, prote layer protects us. There's often pit zips and, and we can really regulate quite efficiently in some pretty great temperature ranges with that three layer system with the right material that we're using. Here's a great example of, of someone who's created a fire and, and really kept it under control and burning in the wintertime. And another one who's probably taken some bushcraft and found some great wood stock there to <laughs> create uh, their shelter with a bit of a lean-to, an emergency shelter, uh, lots of wood there and, and can keep warm and that, that should reflect some, some heat in there to his shelter while he waits. So clothing is important, fire, shelter, all key pieces to keeping comfortable until search and rescue can find you. A search and rescue look for you, it's often on the ground, uh, via snowmobile, um, on mountain bikes outside of winter season, sometimes in aircraft. It's not always in aircraft. I know a lot of the media coverage in the high density, density populated areas in the province southwest see a lot of helicopter use. That's, that's not always the case everywhere we go in the province, so keep that in mind. If you find yourself lost, if you do happen to hear an emergency uh, aircraft overhead, here's a great example of someone who's, who's created an SOS. They've made it big, bright, colorful. So here's some ideas to be heard, seen. Um, brighter, bolder, louder are your key pieces. And as we conclude, because we want to open up for some questions and a couple more polls, I believe, and offer our prizes. Uh, as a reminder, let's try to incorporate those three T's the best we can, trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. Adding the season and sport specific year, uh, using us and Avalanche Canada as reliable industry uh, leaders in outdoor education and using our information and courses, sharing it with your friends and family so that we can all spend time out there. Uh, we all know how to take our phone on our camera 
on our phones, go over the QR code that will access you to the app. And again, just a few stats there. There were just over 2,000 search and rescue calls in 2021. So we're still COVID, deep in COVID at that point. Um, so just a positive though, at, we've checked some stats from last year, 2022, and that was 1,636, which is back to pre-pandemic levels, which is really exciting. Um, so keep up the good work there because you're all doing that, your friends, your family, other enthusiasts out there. It's, it's taken some time for us to get through this as we still do, but those numbers are promising and it, it is a downward trend. So it's a, it's a great thing to share with everyone. Ultimately though, your, your sound judgment and knowing when to turn around, remember that are key pieces and, and one of your most important pieces of survival out there. If you plan to go and something changes and could be weather, group dynamics, energy of your group, literally, physically, mentally, uh, it's okay to turn around and save it for another day. Don't forget that. Thanks very much, everybody. Scott can join me and we can take any questions. And I think we have a couple more polls to share with you. And then we can talk about some of the, the prizes that we want to offer away. So there's, um, I think one of the key points to remember is if you're going out, your destination is home, right? And to that end, it's, it's not to the peak, right? That's only halfway there. It, when you get, your destination is to get home. So to that end, there's a couple questions. Uh, I'm going to roll them together because I think it's a really important ones from Olga and Christina. Olga says, uh, you mentioned that getting lost or confused is the second most popular reason for SAR calls, which of course it is. Uh, is there a recommendation of how early or when to call SAR when you've been lost for a while? And Christina pretty much asked the same question. It's a different, slightly different way of saying, it. when do you know you're in an emergency? It's pretty obvious when you get injured. If you get lost, how lost is an emergency? And I think that really talks to that destination part of it. Like we want to get home and there's usually only so many hours in the day. So how do you determine whether or not, you know what? Because, you know, I get lost relatively often. Uh, and it's usually only for like 10, 15 minutes. And I'll go, oh yeah, there it is. I, I, I backtrack and then I go, oh, there's the diamond on the tree. And yeah, now I can keep going, right? Uh, so how do I know when is the right time to go, holy crow, I'm not finding the diamond? Yeah, you made some good points, Scott, and those are great questions. I'm glad you put them together. Thanks for asking. Uh, you know, I love to head outdoors, and I do a lot, so does Scott, with people I know, and, and, and we make decisions um, well together, and we strategize well together, we plan well together, we respond to hiccups well together and 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 I know activities now often are done by those who don't know each other very well and it might be through meetup. So those decisions in the field, if we're lost, as we're using this example, might be different for that group. I can't emphasize enough about that, even trailhead chat, if you're new to a group to each other. Uh, but in the heat of the moment, you know, if you think you're in trouble and if you think you're turned around, apply the stop analogy really use that use that to your advantage someone uh, commented the other day when we posted about it and they said this doesn't just have to be for emergencies in the mountains this can be for anything anywhere in your day if, if you're there's an emergency <laughs> mentally physically literally stop think observe plan and i think even just me saying it and slowing down and thinking it it grounds me and so in that emergency out on the trail let's say snowshoeing micro spiking have that chat at that time after you've stopped with your group if you know them or not have that conversation uh, check your maps check your phones check whatever resources you brought that you, you that you're using that you're using to navigate and if you can in that situation align yourself and like scott said sometimes it's a couple steps forward or back up there's the marker okay we're good Maybe visibility wasn't good. Maybe someone made a poor right decision when it should have been left. You know, give yourself some credit. If you really think that you're lost, uh, as I said, uh, call for help and, and initiate that. Search and rescue and Scott can back me up. I'm sure they would rather be on their way to find you and have um, their SAR manager say, okay, it's off or they're stood down. Then Absolutely. you wait and delay that call. So if you really think you need help, uh, don't hesitate. The way I do it for myself is I look at how many hours are left in the day. So 
if I'm if I'm injured, it's a completely different thing. But if I am lost, uh, I go, okay, can I backtrack? In the winter, that's usually fairly easy, and I can get back to where I started. And if that's where if if this wasn't a through hike and I'm going back to where I started, that's something I can do is I can just back up and I don't know, go home. Uh, if it is there's no snow on the ground or I can't determine my track from someone else's. Um, what I usually do is I usually want to make sure that I have an hour of safety margin at the end of the day where there's, where there's daylight. If I know that at this point in time, my distance from here to the trailhead is, if I left right now and I got, I would get back to the trailhead with less than an hour left, I'm in an emergency situation, right? And I'm in a, in a position where I'm chewing up that daylight. So if I, yeah, maybe I might take five minutes at that point in time, but at that point after that, it's like, okay, something's gone horribly wrong here. If I have the ability to, to, to contact someone, I will, uh, but I don't want to use up that hour because that hour, while I'm trying to run to get to the trailhead is the one where I'm going to break my ankle, which you've now broken my leg, my ankle and my foot tonight. <laughs> I just want to point that out. So you're I'm going to, I'm going to break another part of my appendage. There's only so many parts that you can do. Maybe my knee is next, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to do that by, by rushing at the end. And so if I make that call and then I do end up getting out, they might not even like, SAR might not even be at the trailhead by the time I get out. And I can call them and I can say, hey, turn around and they'll be great. Thank you. So glad that you, you got out. But please, whatever you do, if you call SAR and you get out, call us back. Please don't just leave. <laughs> yes. Communication is key, isn't it? Communication is key. Absolutely. Um, what are your thoughts about carrying a pro beacon and shovel when snowshoeing alone? So I think there's a two-parter question to this. Snowshoeing alone is one part, but uh, Brian is not intending to enter avalanche terrain, but he thinks he's close enough that if he witnessed an accident, uh, he would might be able to help. It's a lot of weight to add, but what, does, what do you think is a responsible thing to do? So let's take that in two parts. Let's take the first part of snowshoeing alone, and then let's take the part of whether or not, if you're not in avalanche territory, it makes sense to bring your avalanche gear. Right. So solo adventures, I know they happen. Uh, I know there's enthusiasts out there who choose to, or it defaults to that, or friends and family say, sorry, we're not going, and you go anyway. You know, our adventure smart message, no matter what, is to have others in your group. Really, there's, 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 that's, that's the solid uh, adventure smart answer to share with you. We want to always be with others in case something happens. I always say three is my, is, you know, the ideal situation if there is an emergency again okay now you've broken your shoulder Scott here's the third the fourth the fifth injury for you uh and I'm first aid now and my daughter Haley is in charge of communications so there's a situation where we have enough of us to each have a role uh, three or four even you know there's there's a, there's more uh, roles in an emergency situation to manage that situation than just one or two or three or four, ideally, right? Someone's starting a fire, someone's communication, someone's first aid, someone's creating shelter, someone's getting some food on the go. So imagine the best scenario you can. And that isn't just with one person out there. So the best scenario is with others to support you and you can to and you to support them. That that's that's uh that's a solid adventure smart answer to that one. Uh, yeah, the other uh, on to the oh second part. Yeah, the second part going into terrain that isn't avalanche prone, uh, if that's an example, uh, is, you know, tonight's session is about backcountry travel. Tonight's session is about going into that backcountry terrain. And if you're heading into backcountry terrain that is unmanaged space, i.e. not a ski area, not a defined trail system that is managed through a ski patrol, um, trail staff you are going into space that is unmanaged, right? And and so the ideally, again, you're with others. Ideally, you're all carrying the essentials. Ideally, you are all carrying the avalanche transceiver shovel probe. You've had the training, you've joined us for one of our snow safeties, and you've taken an avalanche skills training course. That's the ideal build of that, that adventure. 
you know, you're, you're setting yourself up for success. Um, and then if you're carrying these pieces of equipment, which, which, you know, the avalanche transceiver is against your body, it's on your person, it's underneath your layers, it's as close, it's, it's on your base layer, and then you're puffy in your outer, so that's there. The, the, the shovels are light, efficient pieces of equipment, and the probes are super light. So it's not onerous to carry, uh, but knowing how to use it is, is the kicker, right? And if I'm equipped with that with my group, uh, and I'm choosing to go into these areas, then, uh, then I've got it in case something happens in our area to our group and or if we come across another. If I can add to that, if I'm heading out there to carry these pieces of gear with me into areas that isn't avalanche prone, then maybe I'm going out to practice. I'm going out to practice with my gear, right? What you can do in all seasons, put it in a plastic bag and bury it in the beach. Yeah. Uh, you can hide it in your house somewhere under a couch cushion and play with your kids uh, and or you go with your family and friends and outdoor adventures in the winter and pick a spot somewhere that's not avalanche prone and go do some practice uh, uh, test runs. It's a great way to keep up on your skills. I know we're going long, but we have a lot of really good questions. Are you okay with taking one more before we get to the admin? Absolutely. And I'm so sorry no for the people who I'm not getting to because there are great questions. Uh, Jennifer has a question, and I don't know the answer to this one at all, so I'm hoping you can help. How do you address a group where part of the group is keen to complete the hike, but others are feeling uneasy about the time or conditions? And uh, we're talking about, do we split the group up? Do we, like, how do we have that difficult conversation? I'm not really great at difficult conversations, so I'm hoping you'll be able to give a tip. I love that this question came up. I really do. And, and it's come up recently, uh, when I say recently, this winter. Uh, it, I think it might have been late fall where there was an incident out there. We won't get into the specifics of it, but I can highlight what we can do, and what, it, which wouldn't be easy in a situation to, to address this, right? Um, again, I'll go back to that. Sorry to be that <laughs> onerous repeater of that information, but let's go back to that first T and that trip planning. And we, we're having discussions there. We're actually having discussions uh, about what if this happens? What if you and Scott and Haley and Brady and Walker and we're all out going to do an activity and two of us want to continue and two of them are spent, done, they've exceeded their abilities and want to turn around. We're going to talk about that over the nachos and beer in our trip planning phase, right? So that when we get out there and if that actually happens, we kind of can say, hey, remember when we chatted about if that doesn't happen, still stop. Let's apply that stop analogy again. So it has so many applications. And think about how we can mitigate this situation. And, and Scott, you reminded everyone, and thanks for that, our destination is home. It's not that summit. It's not that peak. And as something has happened in the group dynamics, we're always going to stay together. We're not going to exceed someone else's abilities because another can reach the halfway, the peak so that they can get home. We're gonna have that discussion right there on the trail and we're gonna stop. And as I got this last slide here, we're gonna use our sound judgment as a group to support each other and really talk about this, is a, this, this might be a turnaround point. This might be our turnaround point today based on weather, uh, trail conditions, uh, daylight, abilities of the group. Someone's tired, mentally not well. And, and so having that conversations and this ties really well into, which I didn't mention, our third reason for the most common reasons for search and rescue in BC is exceeding abilities. Mm -hmm. So let's say this conversation um, came about and two of them decided to go and the three others were like, oh, okay, yeah, I guess we'll stay together. Really, they wanted to turn around. Now those three are exceeding their abilities. That's the third most common reason for search and rescue. Put on that sound judgment and, and use that sound judgment and make that decision together to support each other so that you can reach your destination. And that might be your turnaround point. And maybe you get to come back next weekend or next month and try it again. So you get to do it twice, which is a good thing. You can always offer to pay for a hot chocolate uh, uh, for the people who are keen to go <laughs> uh, when they when they get back, right? Or hot chocolate or a beer. Listen, I'll pay for you, but I'm sorry about that. Yeah, but we do need separating. To separating is is always something we want to avoid. So let's stick together and and reach that destination, which it might be um, earlier than we think, but it's still a great adventure. Bob had one comment, uh, and that'll be the last thing that we'll be able to get to today. Sorry, folks. Uh, he says he thinks people forget that it takes time to organize a, a search and commence it. 
question he asks himself when planning a trip is, does he have enough resources to tide him over until help arrives? And as you said, six hours is the average based on the re most recent uh, reports we have. Uh, that means that there are some that are way more. And there are some that are less, right? Uh, and if it's 14 hours, it could be 16 hours, right? Uh, average is only right in the middle. <laughs> you can get people things at either end. Um, and Bob asks himself if he doesn't have enough resources to tide him over till help arrives, what should he uh, add to his pack? Like, what are the things that he's going to need to do? So he, he makes that question at the trailhead, which seems to make a lot of sense to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's do a quick poll. See if Sounds people good. people uh, uh, remember what we what we talked about here. Uh, I, I already told you this average search and rescue call lasts uh, six hours. So I'm not going to ask that question again, but I'm going to ask you this one. Hit me. When you're waiting for rescue in the winter, what met methods do you recommend to keep warm? What recommends what methods do I recommend you keep warm? Go for it. <laughs> so I'll let you know everyone who's here. Scott made this list tonight. This, this is a great list of uh, select one or more of the following. Let's see. We could have some interesting answers, Scott. I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping folks that, oh, there we go. Once I hit that number there, we go ahead and share. I'm hoping folks uh, selected uh, plenty of whiskey because they wanted to play, which is uh, <laughs> which is fine. But generally, don't forget uh, alcohol in the winter cools you down because it uh, opens up the uh, um, uh, it makes your face feel warm by opening up the uh, the uh, vessels of the uh, blood vessels, uh, but that actually cools you down faster, so it lower your uh, your temperature. But all those other options great options for uh, keeping you warm in, while you're waiting for rescue. Now, Sandra, you had things to give away. Were you gonna ask questions, perhaps? I am. So Mountain Equipment Company has graciously offered an awesome, it's an award-winning, which I wasn't aware of until I, I heard from them, uh, Tour 32 pack. It's, so it's an awesome, pack and I, you may have seen it I added it to the discussion of our event uh, recently so you could see it's really cool pretty sleek looking and I was curious um, so what we normally do is we ask a question and I've got one queued up the first person to type in the answer to Scott will win this pack from Mountain Equipment Company and we mentioned it earlier on in the presentation and it's a little bit about search and rescue and I'm curious if you've got your fingers ready everybody the first person to type in the right answer. Can you remember how many search and rescue groups we have in British Columbia? I believe Scott mentioned it. A number of people, a number of people uh, had, have actually, and uh, came right up the top. We had one even before you even sent it, finished, sentence, uh, finished your sentence. And that was from Michelle who said 78. Nice, thanks Michelle. Right, we've got 78 BC search and rescue groups around the province, uh, consisting of 2,600 search and rescue volunteers. And now that you know, as of last year, stats were at 1,636 search and rescue calls. So hopefully we can keep up that downward trend. So that's great, congratulations. So we've got one more prize to offer. And uh, don't forget that everyone that joined us tonight will get uh, access to one month free trial with FATMAC, which is exciting. But the next giveaway is from Hail Sound Equipment. They offer a great set of trail crampons. They're awesome. I don't know if you've ever used them. I prefer them over to snowshoes. You can just put them on and away you go. You've gripped forever. Uh, this is a great one. So we talked a lot tonight about our three T's. We talked about emergency signaling and there's some commonalities to a lot of that. Um, how many layers, everybody's ready. How many layers should you wear to effectively manage your your heat regulation of your body? What's the layering system? You can just let us know how many layers you should be wearing. A lot of people are saying three layers. Is that what you want us you want us to look at? I've got a four in there though, interestingly. And I have a 78, so I'm guessing that's probably wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they might be okay, answering the previous question. If you've actually put on 78, I need to see that. Please let us know. <laughs> So yes, yeah, so Joe uh, was the first person to answer three. So remind us what those three layers are. 
So we've got our base layer and it's synthetic polypro polypropylene or synthetic. So it's nice and fitted and hugs you really well to wick away the moisture. Uh, the mid layer is thermal, it's puffy or a fleece, which really uh, regulates and keeps you warm. And then that outer is protective, it's Gore-Tex often. Uh, and that protects you from wind, sleet, snow, rain, and has some pit zips. So that three layering system allows you to really easily in great temperatures, extreme, uh, regulate your, your temperature really well. So great. Those are great crampons, by the way. And that pack is awesome too. Marvelous. And I think we're pretty much done. You're going to get that fat map link when you get an email tomorrow from us. Uh, and it'll be, it'll be there as well. So don't have to worry about trying to grab it from the chat. Uh, and we have more of these sessions coming up, don't we? We do. So we've got a really great one coming up in February, and it's with a good Samaritan who applied the stop analogy, actually. And it, it's in conjunction with Squamish Search and Rescue. So it's a Sea to Sky Corridor uh, incident. And she applied the stop analogy and helped an injured hiker that she came across. So her and her husband applied uh, that um, one of our messages and she said she she really was introduced to that stop analogy from us was out there on a trail with someone and was able to apply that message so that's pretty cool the one after that is with a lost hiker and that person's going to share their story and that's in relation to ridge meadows search and rescue and then the last one is on march 21st with will gad mountain hero uh, adventure athlete uh, if you don't know about him look him up and if you know about them, you'll want to join. Uh, so we've got a few more to go, and then we're already queuing up for summer 2023. It's not that far away. Thank you very much, everybody. Nope. Thanks, everybody, Thank for much. helping us. We really appreciate you taking the time to show us uh, uh, the Snow Safety Adventure Smart presentation. Pleasure. And thanks to everyone who joined us. Hope to see you again. And this really does help reduce the number and severity of search and rescue calls for the province of BC. Take care. Good night. Take care.